Okay, now now you've got me confused. What is AED? That's the little electric uh, electro- oh, electronic I, yeah the paddle kit that you bring out. Put the pads on. Yeah. Okay. Right? Yeah. Pads go upper right, lower left, and then it. There's a big push a few years ago to have those uh, paddles, those that uh, equipment available everywhere you look. I have not heard that push. Are they still readily available in most public buildings? They are in schools. Now, the public buildings is another story. Maybe yeah. Jason Barrett, who is a state senator, can answer that question. Ja- Jason can answer most questions for us. Do you know where the AED machines are in the state capitol, Jason? Uh, actually, uh, I do. I, I do. Uh, there are signs and stuff, so I couldn't tell you exactly where they are, but as you walk through the capitol, there are signs pointing uh, for the defibrillators. Awesome. Well, that's good to know. And I guess they're in a lot of public buildings, but uh, we tend to not pay as much attention to where they're located as what we should. Yeah, not, not until you need it. Right. right. When you need one, you're going to need it. Right. Hey, uh, by the way, a program note, uh, Majority Leader Eric Halsorder will be on the program Monday at uh, 9 o'clock. And uh, thanks to Eric, by the way, for texting in some information during our enlightening conversation with Joe Kinzer, the deputy prosecuting attorney, about uh, the situation at the Eastern Regional Jail. Yeah, and what uh, what I found to be fascinating, Rob, is there's so many dimensions to the issue. We tend to hear about one aspect of it, and that's the, the staffing. But what Joe was saying was there are four or five other layers of concern that he has to be involved with on a regular basis. Jason, did you see the uh, lawsuit? There's a Metro News article on it uh, this morning naming uh, Jim Justice, several other state officials in regards to a class action lawsuit regarding the jail situations in West Virginia, specifically the Southern Regional Jail. Um, I I, I heard of that yesterday, actually, in a conversation. Uh, I'm going to be cautious um, about what I say uh, in this interview as it relates to that because I, I, I have heard um, some of the other side of the story, and, um, you know, this is obviously a lawsuit, so I have to be careful about what I say as it relates to that. Understandable. The lawsuit seeks to force the state to do $270 million in deferred maintenance at the jails, prisons, and juvenile facilities and spending at least $60 million to fill worker vacancies. It alleges that 10,000, about 10,000 state inmates are living in inhumane conditions, and Eric in uh, his text to me earlier this morning, not that long ago, said that you folks appropriated $95 million in the tw- FY24 budget for deferred maintenance. Yeah, and, and actually former Secretary of, of the Homeland Security, Jeff Sandy, came uh, before the Senate Finance Committee uh, to testify uh, as it relates to deferred maintenance. Um, the, in, in the governor's introduced budget, there, there was very little or if any money for deferred maintenance for corrections. And, um, you know, I was pretty tough on Secretary Sandy, uh, in that meeting asking what his request was, um, because it, it didn't seem to me that the way that he was explaining in committee of, of the need for deferred maintenance, um, it, it didn't seem that in that budget, uh, was, uh, was really taken into consideration a lot of that, which is why then the legislature, you know, we put in that the dollar amount that the uh, delegate householder mentioned uh, because there are some deferred maintenance issues. Um, I, I, again, I'll be cautious, but, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot more to the story um, than what's coming out of uh, or how it's being portrayed in that lawsuit. Understandable. Uh, I, I don't the, – the inhumane stuff, I, I think there's a lot more to that, and I, I don't – um, I don't know that I believe those accusations. Can you tell us uh, some of the stuff that's come out of this special session, Jason, that addresses the jail problem? Sure. Well, I mean, I think you have to start with uh, the pay increase uh, to not only uh, uniform officers, but uh, two bonuses for non-uniformed personnel. Um, you know, we're, we're well aware, everyone's been aware that this has been an ongoing crisis in West Virginia with the National Guard. Uh, working in our prisons, uh, obviously, as we've mentioned on the show several times, not having direct inmate contact. Uh, however, uh, you know, those, again, we were able to give a, uh, you know, substantial pay raise uh, to officers. And, and and we spent a lot of time, we had several meetings uh, uh, at the Capitol with corrections, with the court, with the mem- the members of the House, leadership of the House and the Senate, um, to, to come up with, uh, you know, some proposals, and really not just throw money at a problem, but figure out 
um, the best place to use the money. And 95% and of vacancies were in correction officer positions one, two, and three. Uh, and the way that the structure was kind of set up that really in order for those folks to see a substantial pay increase, they had to get into more of an administrative type position, which would take them out of, uh, of the prisons and, and really not be in uh, direct contact with inmates, which these guards are, are, are certainly, a, a, these officers are a special breed of folks. Um, and that's the job they want to do. They don't want to be in administ administrative type roles, probably not what they're suited for. Uh, so we were able to go in and have different classes of these different uh, correction officers, one, two, and three, to be able to provide uh, substantial pay uh, increases to them to keep them in the job they want, uh, but paying them accordingly. So one is it's a twenty three hundred dollar payment right now, uh, Jason, and a twenty three hundred dollar payment in six months. Is that how that's going to work functionally? That's so that that is for the non uniformed personnel. Non uniformed personnel. Will that be a one time payment, or is that a, a salary increase? That those are two one time bonuses of twenty three hundred dollars each. Okay. Bill? Yeah. Uh, uh, Rick Mannon uh, sent something in on a uh, Facebook chat, said that uh, Mike Height did a mini Rob rant last night on the House floor. Uh, uh, can you speak to that, Jason? The mini Rob I'm, rant. I'm wondering, Jason's in the Senate. Did <laughs> you even see yeah. it? <laughs> well, I did. I, I did. I, I was watching uh, uh, the House. Uh, yesterday evening as we were preparing to go in. Uh, and just to give a little bit of background and understanding, when, when we're kind of going back and forth with legislation that, uh, that, you know, when the House is working on a Senate bill and they're going to amend it and they have to send it back to us, when they're in, we're typically not in session because we have to receive the message from them and then act on the message that they send us. So it's kind of – last night was very much like a last night, a regular session where, you know, the House is in, the Senate's out, and vice versa – because we're going back and forth um, and, and um, you know, working bills that way. So, so we typically watch uh, the House when, um, uh, when we're not in. And, it, you know, it is a little more entertaining to watch the House. Um, uh, but uh, that was, in, in regards to your question, uh, that was uh, about the fire and EMS uh, funding, uh, specifically fire funding uh, for um, there are two pockets of money, uh, $3 million for each county uh, distributed by population uh, to help use for fire EMS services. Uh, and then there's $3 million to be divided by population for those counties with a fire levy or a fire fee. And we in the Senate decided that that should be an ongoing priority of the legislature. And so we've using money out of unappropriated dollars from fiscal year 24, uh, which essentially will uh, be base building. And I, I questioned um, Chairman Tarr on the floor last night to ensure that the people knew uh, that because this money goes directly to counties for them to be able to use for fire and EMS, how they see fit, whether that's personnel, apparatus, their discretion. And if we're going to give money to counties to allow uh, them to use it for personnel, it has to be ongoing. It can't be one-time funding because you can't hire folks, pay them the salary for one year, and then not have the, uh, you know, the assurance that you're going to have this money going forward. The problem with some, and I think Delegate Hyde, and I don't want to speak for him, but it's certainly uh, up to him, who didn't think that that money should come from unappropriate dollars. It should come from surplus dollars, um, and, and that was just a, a difference of opinion that, that a, a couple in the House had. Uh, compared to what we wanted to do in the Senate. But we wanted to send a very clear message to counties that we expect this money to be ongoing, um, and that's why it should come out of unappropriated dollars uh, and expect it to be base building uh, for counties to be able to fund fire and EMS uh, at the at a level at which that will really help uh, ensure that, that those folks are able to respond uh, and, and people that are in situations where they need fire and EMS will um, you know, we'll be able to receive those services in the most timely manner. How, how would you rate the rant, though, Jason? Was it was it an was effective, it, good uh, performance? It wasn't, bad. it wasn't bad. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, it's probably on a theatrical score, probably about a seven. Oh, um, that's pretty good. You didn't have a prop. <laughs> well, you, you get if you don't have a prop, you get things. Uh, <laughs> you get a prop. 
Get a point. Yeah, if so, you don't get a point of order from somebody else, that kind of dings you too. That so, takes it down. Yeah. Um, now, you know, the, the, the first, hey, first freshman, it was pretty good. How's that? All right, the, that's good. The standard is a Rob rant. How does it compare to a Rob rant? Is that seventy percent? I don't know if Jason's ever heard of Rob rant. Well, everybody's heard yeah, of Rob I rant. <laughs> I, used to turn the, I used to turn the volume down when it happened. But yeah, I've heard it. Some people just turned it off, so you're ahead of the gang there. I, yeah. I think it's well. It's, I didn't want to say that. It, I mean, it's a fair comparison. All right, that's um, cool. <laughs> it's a fair comparison. Jason, let me go back to this fire, fire EMS, and I, you alluded to it a second ago. I think there's been uh, some clarification, probably more clarification needed on how it's broken down. A uh, couple of questions. One, all the money goes to the county commission or county council, does it not, as opposed to going directly to the individual fire units? Is that right? Well, the, the two $3 million buckets that I mentioned, the, those two appropriations do go directly to the county commission. Oh. There was an additional $6 million uh, from surplus uh, that will go uh, to all fire stations equally across yeah. the state. Okay. Currently, all fire and casualty policies have a 0.55 uh, premium tax that everybody pays. So on all your insurance policies, you'll see it on there. It's a 0.55 percent uh, fee tax, whatever you want to call it, uh, and that goes to the state, and then it is then distributed uh, to all fire stations across the state equally, and there was some discussion uh, to increase that fire fee tax, whatever, from 0.55 percent to 1 percent, and it really wasn't the way in which I wanted to do it, but I certainly wasn't going to go along with uh, Increasing that to one percent, and then still continue to fund it um, per, to to fund each fire station equally across the state. Uh, I, I think that it, this should be formula based uh, when you're doing it this way um, to take in consideration um, uh, area, uh, square miles of a county, take in consideration call volume, to take in consideration uh, some population. Uh, those type of things I think have to be part of a formula if we were going to raise that fee or tax. We didn't do that. There was a supplemental um, to take $6 million uh, to, to fund that. So, uh, and that's what that 0.45 uh, would have been a $12 million. But, you know, I think that half of that was going to go to fire, half of that was going to go to EMS. Or, uh, so all of this goes directly to fire. But, um, but, but because we didn't, um, uh, because we didn't, um, uh, lost my train of thought for a minute, we raised the tax. Um, that's why I was kind of okay with, with going to distribute it equally to all fire stations, uh, but then giving that other two buckets of money, $3 million each, to counties by population. And so I think that's how Berkeley and Jefferson, we kind of uh, even scale a little bit uh, to ensure that they're getting – uh, a, a little bit more of their fair share back in return. Yeah, okay. Looking at this from a 30,000 feet uh, view without getting too much, of, getting locked up in the detail, uh, six million is going to uh, every uh, divided proportionally among all uh, volunteer fire departments in a, in a county. Then there's going to be three million dollars that will be given to uh, the fire department or the counties based on population. Then there's going to be another three million dollars to those counties that have a fire levy or ambulance EMS levy. Uh, a fire or a fire fee. Or a fire fees, yeah, okay. So there's actually three categories. Of those, Berkeley County uh, will uh, uh, satisfies all three of those categories. That's correct. Okay. Uh, and and you're right that the uh, the six million that's divided by all fire stations, that goes directly to the yeah. fire station. That yeah. does not go to the county commission. Yeah. The other two um, pockets of money do go directly to the uh, uh, county to be used specifically uh, for fire EMS services. Yeah. Senator Jason Barrett, our guest here on the program, you allocated another $100 million for road maintenance projects, $50 million for equipment. Uh, in are you satisfied that you're seeing road improvements, Jason, when you, as you drive back and forth to Charleston, as you drive around Berkeley County? Are you happy with the road conditions or at least improvements? I, I don't know that anybody's happy with road conditions. Um, uh, and, and there are you know, certain areas of the state that have roads far worse than the Eastern Panhandle does. Um, the, the cost of, of doing anything now uh, is significantly more expensive than it has been in the past. Um, you know, we have, in the past several years, 
we've made unprecedented investments uh, into road maintenance um, in the state, taking money out of general revenue, taking money out of surplus, um, which we don't typically do. I mean, typically uh, road uh, construction, road maintenance is funded uh, by DMV fees and gasoline tax. And uh, because of the uh, increase uh, in costs of, of road maintenance, uh, because of more fuel-efficient vehicles, um, it, it's clear that uh, those the MV fees and those gasoline taxes aren't enough to keep up with our road maintenance needs. And so that's why we've made these large transfers. Um, would I like to see more projects in the Eastern Panhandle? Absolutely. But I don't think there's a senator or delegate uh, across the state that wouldn't say the same thing about their area. Can you tell me, in regards to Governor Justice's rainy day fund proposed changes, uh, if mm-hmm. if uh, it did it have any kind of momentum whatsoever? Because it, I know it didn't get passed, but what exactly was he trying to do, and what were you trying to stop him from doing, and why? Well, we, the, Senate, the Senate passed it, I, I want to say unanimously, uh, to do it, it, you know, we call it smoothing, uh, where you take a certain number of year look back uh, at your general revenue uh, expenditures, uh, general revenue budget. uh, And so currently we have to take uh, 20% of surplus uh, at the end of the year um, and put in rainy day. And so what this bill did was say that we look back for the past seven years uh, and, and we would smooth out what the contribution uh, would need to be each year. So what it effectively, effectively would have done for this year is instead of transferring $231 million into our rainy day fund, it would have transferred $87 million, $87.5 or $7 million into the rainy day fund. We're getting to a point where our rainy day fund is, is in excess or, or right around a billion dollars. Uh, when you look at uh, what really we should have in rainy day as it compares to our general revenue, uh, we uh, exceed uh, all those expectations uh, from the credit uh, rating agencies. We have the eighth healthiest rainy day fund in the country. And making these large investments or uh, these large deposits into to serve to, to the rainy day fund sounds really good, and, and we should always continue to have a healthy rainy day fund. The problem becomes when you have – investment needs, when you have things that, that capital improvements, investment to, to help bring people to West Virginia to create jobs and deferred maintenance, all these things that, that we all know we need to do, when you decide to kick that can down the road and invest and, and put the money in the rainy day fund that where you hope you get about a 5% return, um, is that really the best use of taxpayer money uh, to continue to uh, – put too much money into a rainy day fund that really doesn't help us um, with uh, the credit rating agencies because we've exceeded um, what they expect of us to have in rainy day. So when you do that, when you kick the can down the road and you don't make the investments in the infrastructure and um, all these other things that help, uh, you know, economic development in our state, um, you know, I think that we're doing a disservice. And then when you did the capital investments and the deferred maintenance, it's just going to cost more in the long run. And, um, so I, I think it, it, it was, had plenty of support in the, in the Senate. Um, I think there was uh, some support uh, in the House, but, but clearly not enough to get across the bench line. Do you think this is something Governor Justice will come back with in January? Oh, I, I would expect that. I would expect the, the Senate to, to continue to want to do that. And I gather, Jason, uh, uh, shifting gears somewhat, uh, the $45 million proposed to go to Marshall University uh, was viewed by the legislators as being uh, of value to the state as a whole? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, th- that is for um, a cybersecurity program uh, that really uh, will be um, the envy of, of the East Coast, I think. And, and Brad Smith, who is the president of Marshall University and the former CEO of Intuit, um, you know, has has unbelievable connection um, in that industry, uh, and, and that's why that's a better fit uh, or a best fit for Marshall as opposed to, to anywhere else. And um, you know, there were some folks that you know wanted to give a like contribution to WVU just because, 
Um, but I think they forget about the very large investment that was made for a cancer center at WVU during regular session. So um, that's just folks getting into, you know, um, playing politics for their particular district in Montgomery County, but it happens. Hey, Jason, thanks so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Senator Thank Jason Barrett.